We're going to continue now with some pathology. Dementia is defined as a progressive global impairment of intellectual function, and it is among the most important topics in this entire chapter. It includes the loss of short-term memory and at least one other cognitive deficit, such as aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, or impaired executive function. In the elderly, it's very important to distinguish dementia from delirium. Dementia is gradual loss and progressive decline. Delirium has an acute onset and typically waxes and wanes throughout the day. There are many causes of dementia, both reversible and irreversible. We'll start with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia in the elderly. There is a genetic predisposition to AD that accounts for a small percentage of patients. These patients have a mutation in APP, that's amyloid precursor protein, or in gamma secretase, and that is the presenilin 1 or presenilin 2 gene. The mutant amyloid precursor protein is cleaved into beta amyloid, or A beta. All of us with age end up accumulating A beta, which is why the prevalence of Alzheimer's increases with age. But A beta accumulates faster in people with the genetic mutation in APP, so they become cognitively impaired at younger ages. Look at these PET images. You have patients with AD on the left and normal controls on the right. The PET scan is looking for amyloid deposits, and you can see that they are much greater in patients diagnosed with AD. The APP gene is located on chromosome 21, so almost all patients with Down syndrome who survive to middle age will develop AD. You know Down syndrome is also trisomy 21, and since the APP gene is on chromosome 21, you have a defective APP gene. There are some other genes to be aware of. APOE4 increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. That would be the late-onset form. Whereas APOE2 is actually protective. If you have time, memorize these genes, but it's not the most relevant aspect of this topic. Alzheimer's disease presents with early problems in memory and visuospatial abilities. MRI may show gross cortical atrophy as well as dilated ventricles. The classic patient with Alzheimer's will be driving down a known road and suddenly find themselves lost. Short-term memory is affected first. As the disease progresses, patients may develop changes in personality and behavior. Hallucinations, delusions, and symptoms of depression can occur. At the end stages, these patients become profoundly disabled, mute, and immobile. The occipital lobe is usually spared, so patients generally do not have visual changes. Now, Alzheimer's currently is a clinical diagnosis that is made once you have ruled out all other causes of dementia. The only confirmation you can have of your diagnosis is by postmortem autopsy. Now, histologically, you'll see widespread cortical atrophy, senile plaques of A-beta depositions, and also neurofibrillary tangles, pictured here, which are composed of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. Keep in mind that neurofibrillary tangles are not specific for Alzheimer's disease. It can be found in other dementias as well. We'll move on to Pick's disease. Pick's disease is also called frontotemporal dementia for the lobes that are affected. If you think through what those two areas encode, it makes sense that the presenting symptoms for these patients, progressive deterioration of language, the temporal lobe, and change in personality, the frontal lobe. For example, they may become euphoric, disinhibited, compulsive, or abulic. Abulic means that the person cannot exercise willpower or make decisions. These symptoms occur before memory disturbance, which clinically can help distinguish this disease from Alzheimer's. Also, visuospatial function is relatively preserved in Pick's disease. On imaging, you'll often find frontotemporal atrophy. Histologically, you'd find the characteristic Pick bodies, which contain abnormal accumulations of tau proteins. Lewy body dementia is different from Alzheimer's disease and Pick's because it includes an element of Parkinsonism. These patients frequently have fluctuating dementia and visual hallucinations. The disease is defined by diffuse involvement of cortical neurons with Lewy body inclusions and an absence of neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques, which are found in Alzheimer's. Lewy body inclusions are aggregated alpha-synuclein and are also seen in Parkinson's disease. 
unlike Parkinson's disease, the Parkinsonism associated with Lewy body dementia is usually symmetrical and unfortunately minimally responsive to dopamine therapy. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, is a prion disease that presents as rapidly progressive dementia over merely weeks to months. There is variable focal involvement of the CNS, including myoclonus, or extra pyramidal signs such as rigidity, bradykinesia, tremor, dystonia, chorea, or athetosis. Now, prions are infectious proteins, and they are a very rare etiologic cause of dementia. There is no treatment for CJD, and death usually results within seven months. Histologically, one would see a spongiform cortex. Last, we'll discuss some of the other causes of dementia, a few of which are reversible. Within the brain parenchyma, we have normal pressure hydrocephalus, certain mass lesions like tumors or cysts, and vascular dementia. Some systemic causes include hypothyroidism, thiamine or vitamin B12 deficiency, as you might see in alcoholics, Wilson's disease, liver or kidney failure, also known as hepatic encephalopathy or uremia, and also neurosyphilis. In evaluating a patient with dementia, you should always check lab tests to rule out these treatable causes. For example, you might send off a TSH and a B12 level, electrolytes, and a VDRL. What did we say was the triad for normal pressure hydrocephalus? Well, it was wet, wacky, and wobbly, standing for urinary incontinence, dementia, and gait abnormalities. Now, why have we mentioned this twice? Well, this is one of the only dementias that is reversible. And if it's reversible, that means you should do something about it. Now, it's important to realize that about 10% of patients who present with signs or symptoms of dementia are actually depressed. This is called pseudodementia. All patients with possible dementia should be screened for depressed mood, anhedonia, anorexia, weight loss, insomnia or hypersomnia, as well as suicidality. Depression is treatable, and many other forms of dementia, sadly, are not. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that causes demyelination of the white matter in the CNS. The symptoms of MS depend on where specifically the demyelination occurs. Patients present with episodic neurologic symptoms like optic neuritis, spastic paraparesis, numbness or tingling in a limb, scanning speech, intention tremor, incontinence, and nystagmus. Scanning speech means that there are abnormally long pauses between words or syllables. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, which was described earlier, is nearly pathognomonic for MS and is most often bilateral. A mnemonic that might help you remember the characteristics of MS is SIN for scanning speech, several things with I, intention tremor, incontinence, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and nystagmus. Multiple sclerosis classically affects women in their late 20s and early 30s, but there is a subtype of MS which is more common in men. In both genders, MS usually presents before a person turns 55. Now, here in this MRI scan, you can see periventricular plaques, which are the gold standard for diagnosing MS. And you have another image of MS in this flare scan. The diagnosis of MS is established based on clinical symptoms and MRI findings. On MRI, it's important to demonstrate multiple lesions that are in the white matter and that are separated by both time and space. For the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, you can also obtain CSF through a lumbar puncture, which will demonstrate mild lymphocytosis, especially after an acute relapse, as well as oligoclonal bands. But note that the bands are not entirely specific for MS. Treatment for acute relapses is corticosteroids. To prevent exacerbations, many patients use beta interferon therapy or natalizumab. Symptomatic treatment is available for the many sequelae of demyelination. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an acute or subacute progressive polyradiculopathy, meaning that it affects multiple peripheral nerves. Weakness is more pronounced than the sensory deficits. Guillain-Barre syndrome starts out as a symmetric sensory, motor, or mixed deficit. It usually starts distally and then ascends proximally. It can involve one or both sides of the face. The diagnosis is made by clinical symptoms and findings of increased CSF protein and also by correlating with EMG.
The syndrome has an unknown etiology, but sometimes it follows infections, vaccinations, or surgical procedures. Now, what is the classic infection that's associated with GBS? Well, it is Campylobacter enteritis. Herpes virus infection can do it as well. The pathogenesis is thought to be autoimmune related, so Guillain-Barre syndrome can occur a few weeks after the initial infection. These patients definitely should be hospitalized because they develop autonomic instability if the diaphragm becomes affected, at which point you would need to provide respiratory support. For treatment, there is essentially only supportive therapy for symptom relief. IVIG or plasmapheresis has been attempted. Most patients make a good recovery, but it can take months to return to baseline. The disorders mentioned in this entry are relatively rare, so you might be better off spending extra time studying dementia, but they are important, so we're going to discuss them. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is the demyelination of the CNS due to destruction of oligodendrocytes by reactivation of the JC virus. Now, JC virus is almost ubiquitously found in the population, but it stays latent until reactivation, which mainly occurs in immunocompromised patients, such as those with AIDS or transplant recipients. These patients will then present with altered mental status, aphasia, ataxia, hemiparesis or hemiplegia, and visual field disturbances. This would depend, of course, on which areas of the cortex are affected. The symptoms are stepwise and progressive. For diagnosis, obtain a PCR for JC virus in the CSF. The prognosis is quite poor, with death occurring in about three to six months after onset of symptoms. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, refers to the neurologic sequela of infectious fevers such as measles, rubella, smallpox, or chickenpox, and also vaccines, notably the live rabies vaccine. It is thought that the acute inflammation instigates a demyelinating disease throughout the brain and spinal cord. On imaging, it looks identical to MS, but it's distinguished on the basis of temporality. Remember we said that MS has lesions that are separated in time, whereas those in ADEM occur all at once. ADEM is more pronounced in children. They usually present with neurologic symptoms as the acute infection is resolving. Usually there is altered mental status, headache, fever, and ataxia. The treatment is primarily with steroids, but IVIG as well as plasmapheresis have also been tried. Metachromatic leukodystrophy is an autosomal recessive, inherited lysosomal storage disease affecting the myelin sheath. In metachromatic leukodystrophy, there is a deficiency in the enzyme aryl sulfatase A. Thus, the Schwann cells become engorged with material that they would otherwise degrade. These uncleared lipid metabolites damage the myelin sheath, leading to mental and motor impairment. The prognosis is poor in most patients. They frequently die within the first five years of life. Those who survive to adolescence often have impaired school performance, progressive dementia, or a psychiatric disorder. The thing to remember about this disease is that it's one of the lipid storage diseases that has neurological effects. Now, just to double check, what's the enzyme that's missing? Correct, aryl sulfatase A. And what symptoms would you look for? This would be an infant with motor delay, frequent falls, and abnormal posture. Charcot Marie tooth disease is the most common inherited neuropathy. It actually represents a heterogeneous group of different disorders that share the same clinical phenotype with progressive weakness of the distal muscles in the limbs with or without sensory loss. There may also be pes cavus of the feet and reduced or absent deep tendon reflexes. The type 1 disease is demyelinating. On the other hand, type 2 disease is neuronal. Unlike muscular dystrophy, which affects the muscles, Charcot-Marie tooth affects the nerves that innervate the muscles. In both, they relatively spare the sensory neurons, but occasionally patients can experience pins and needle sensations in the hands and feet. Patients with CMT have normal cognitive functions and usually a normal lifespan. Unfortunately, there is no treatment, but patients can be helped quite a bit by providing physical therapy and supportive care.